when you're doing good, don't be discouraged. If you feel like any type of pride or complacency, just like comfortableness coming in and you're looking down on all the ones down in the valley and going, oh, I'm glad I'm not like them or them. Okay, just compare yourself to Jesus. Look up. Look up and compare yourself to him and it'll keep you humble. This is a uh, video editor's note. Yeah, sorry guys, the audio is a little bit choppy in this recording. Not quite sure why. Um, it does uh, kind of bother you probably for the first couple minutes or so, but then you kind of get used to it. And luckily the choppiness of the audio and the skippiness of the video isn't so bad and so long to the point where you don't understand what they're saying. But it still is not optimal and definitely not what we were shooting for. So uh, we do apologize once again on behalf of Light of the World Gospel Ministries. But we hope it still ministers unto you, even though it is a little bit hard to listen to. Thanks, guys. Okay, so tonight we are on the subject of what is revival part three. And if you've missed part one and part two, please know, just drop me an email and I will give you the notes if you want them. Um, we've looked at definitions of what is revival. And basically, let me sum up what revival is. Revival is an awakening, a reawakening. So basically, you can only revive something that was once alive. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of the time when we think of revival, we think of the lost. Would you agree? That's not revival. Revival is not the, the lost coming to Christ. That's a result of the church waking up. Does that make sense? So the church was alive. It's lost. It's far. The church gets back. It's far. Then guess what? The lost start to be changed. So it's so important that we know what revival is or we can actually run our whole lives with a delusion about what it is. So you and me can lose the far. I'm not talking about we're losing the salvation here. I'm talking about losing the fire to the degree where we need to reawaken. Like, basically, we're alive. We've just about got a pulse, but we're sleeping. We're napping. Okay? So, um, we're not supposed to be spiritually napping or slumbering tonight. Um, can I say this? Because we've been talking, last week we've been talking about three churches. And, and we'll bring up the... So, I'm not going to be... We, we covered these last week, but I want to cover... Just tonight by reading it, to look at this was the problem. Then we're going to look tonight on what is the answer to all this. Church in Sardis, Revelation 3, 1. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. The church of Ephesus, Revelation 2, 4. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. The church of the Laodicea. Sins, Revelation three fifteen through seventeen. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. Thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. By the way, I. Maybe I should have left it in there because I was just trying to cram it all onto one page. But after he says you're neither cold nor hot, what does he say after that? Yeah. So I didn't leave it out to be you know, politically correct or not offend anybody. I just it was just I was trying to just keep the the salient points in regard to um, what he was actually saying about them, where they were spiritually. Okay. So <laughs> these were three churches. We need to remember this were three churches in Asia Minor, which today is Turkey. The, the territory today is Turkey, but back in Bible times, the territory was actually Greece. It belonged to Greece. So, the big thing, the shocking thing for me is that this was, this all occurred approximately 66 years after the cross. And, you know, to think about that, how could they, how could they be living like this 66 years after the cross. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. And I was talking to somebody today that's, um, in fact, Roland here. Roland's older than 66. So, no, but think about this. Roland, when, when, 
Okay, so I think you're 85. Is that right? Yeah. He doesn't look it. He looks about 65, okay? But um, but if you think about that, Roland going back in his life 66 years, what age would you have been 66 years ago? How old would you have been 66 years ago? Somebody help me. 19? Okay, you were 19 66 years ago. Now, I know talking to... People that are older than me, they'll say, it just seems like yesterday that I was at school, that I was getting married, that the kids were this height. But I'm telling you, 66 years wasn't really that long. It was just a blink in history. But yet, within 66 years, the churches were getting messed up. They had lost their fire, they would lost their zeal, they would lost their vision, they would lost their purpose. Now, the reason I'm saying that is, it's a challenge for us, that not only us, but our kids... That's why we need to bring our kids up in the faith because literally that could have been just a, a generation and a half. Like 40 years is a generation. So 66 is like a generation and a half. So really, it wasn't that long before compromise was coming in. So that it could be your kids, it could be your grandkids that start to give way to what is really the truth. So let's train our kids up to stand for the truth. Let's bring the kids up in the tweenies, in the children, in the youth to actually love the Lord and to follow the Lord. And not just a, a religious Jesus, but the Jesus of the Bible. Amen? Okay, so I want to say this before actually moving on. And that is this. We've all probably backslidden sometime, to whatever degree. Would you agree? Do you want scripture to support that? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Okay, so would you agree? We have all to some degree backslidden. And backslidden is just going back. Like there was a time when, if there's a time in your Christian walk where you, you were more on fire than you are now, then you backslidden. You've went back. You have fallen back in your, in your discipline, in your zeal, in your uh, activity for the Lord that you've literally let yourself move back. Um, but Here's a thought that my friend Davy had shared with me years ago, and it was whenever he said it, I kind of, I can't. It's one of those thoughts that I carried for a while, and I meditated upon it. And he said, "The backslider cannot come back when he wants to." He said, "This God has got a time to get our attention, and just like in salvation, it's not like you know, Pastor shoots um, Jen's uh, old pastor used to say this." He says, when you're young in the faith, you, you testify, I came to the Lord on such and a date. But the longer you go on in your faith, you say, well, what? He came, he came to me. He came to me back 30 years ago. Because he came to me when I couldn't come to him. So I'm one of the signs of growth in the Lord is, not that I came to the Lord back in December, back in 19, whenever. Um, but the Lord came to me and he got my attention. And I bowed the knee to him. Well, it's the same for the backslider. You, you want the backslider to come right back and whatever. And, and the other thing is the backslider thinks they're in control of things. The backslider thinks, well, you know, I'll, I'll give this a couple of months. And then after two months, I'm going to do this. And it's like, it doesn't happen. And let me give you the best illustration that I can give you. Okay, would you agree the Holy Spirit is described in Scripture as wind? Wind of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, the wind of the Holy Spirit blew in. Okay, well, if any of you are have ever been in a sail, any of you ever been like in a sailing boat that requires sails, or have any ever done windsurfing? You ever see the windsurfing? They're like on a board, and you ever see it? They've got like a big. I have to steer that. Anybody seen that there on TV or in? Okay, so I've yeah. I've done windsurfing. Spain back when I was in the Mediterranean. I was a young fella and I loved it. Literally, once the wind caught a hold of you, it was like, it was like, honestly, it was phenomenal. But, but, had anybody ever been in a sailing boat? Like, where, where you're literally dependent upon the wind? Let me describe it like this it's what happens if there's no wind? What, what if you're, what if you're there with your, doing your windsurf and there's no wind? Okay, what if you're in your sailing boat and you've got the most beautiful sails and there's no wind? Guess what happens? 
Okay, it's a bit like that when it comes to the backslider. The ba- when the wind blows, the, the backslider can respond. But I'm telling you what, that God has got a moment, a situation, a time, where he is going to get the backslider's attention. Would you agree with that? That, that God is working all things for his purposes. Amen? So I'm just saying that whenever we're talking about, when you're talking about needing revival, if we need revival, that means there's backsliddenness in the camp. Okay, so I'm just saying that there's a moment where God decides enough's enough, I'm going to move. And when God decides to move, nobody's going to need to tell you, hey, believe God's moving, you'll just know. And what will happen is, and I, I do believe we're going to witness this, where God is going to come in to the, his house in such a powerful way that literally we're all going to put the seals up at the one time. And I'm telling you, there's going to be such a power that it's, it's just going to be like he's here, he's moving, and it's unmistakable, and our kids are going to be part of it, we're going to be part of it. It's a sovereign move of God. So remember, revival is God reviving us, not us reviving ourselves. I'm telling you, any doctrine that is built upon you sorting yourself out is false. Why? Why, Les? What else are we? When it comes to spiritual matters, what, what's, the, what's the problem? How many times have you said, right, I'm done with that. Like, I'm not doing that again. And it, but I'm telling you, when God gives you the strength, you can overcome that. And I, because he, he can take the desires away for that which is wrong, and he can give you new desires that are more attractive. But I'm just trying to please know this. On whatever subject you look at, it is so important that God is the big one in the picture and we're the small one in the picture. And that is no more prevalent than on this subject of revival. God is the big person in the picture here. So I just want to say that by way of introduction tonight as we're moving forward. So I wrote a couple of things down here. Um, Kyle, do you want to read this for us tonight? As people get on fire, their priorities change, their dedication and commitment grows. As people take their foot off the pedal and black backslide, their priorities change. Dedication and commitment slip. The telltale signs of black backsliddenness and of apathy creep in. Okay, this here as well. A failure to commit to very elementary Christian duties. So let me just introduce this first. Um, okay, here's some of the telltale signs. When somebody is uh, becoming apathetic and or backslidden. This is what happens. A failure to commit to very elementary Christian duties. A failure to fulfill one's vocation. A failure to meet the need around us. Um, so I'll say this here, and please hear, hear me right. I'm talking to you as a pastor here. One of the duties of a pastor is not just to preach the word. Um, one of the number one things is to preach the Word of God, to bring God's heart to this congregation. But I want to say that really up there with that there is the pastor is here to shepherd the sheep. Okay? If I see you taking a wrong turning or letting apathy or backsliddenness come into your Christian walk, if I love you, what should I do? Should I just watch on and say, hey, that's cool? What, what, if I love you, if, I gen, um, if I'm a genuine shepherd, what should I do when I see you taking a wrong turn? In? What should you do when you see me taking a wrong turn? Hopefully do it graciously, because <laughs> I'm telling you what, listen, we all have a susceptibility, all of us, to take our foot off the pedal, to get comfortable, and let all types of thing come in. I mean, honestly, just don't make an effort for a week and see where you end up spiritually. It's not pretty. And I'm just saying that we're here to look out for each other. And I'm telling you, if we want to experience revival, part of it is looking out for each other. So a lot of time people get out with the pastor because he's actually having to be there to bring the heart of God to the individual. And you can imagine if they're not 
a good place? Do they really want to talk to the pastor? Okay. Do they really want to like talk to God? Okay. And I'm just saying this that I've found if they're in the outs with God, they're normally in the outs with the pastor. So, but that's okay. I'm here, hopefully, to be faithful to him and please him, not please you. And But I know that if you're genuine in this house, and this house is full of genuine people tonight, if you're a genuine believer, you recognize God's voice when your brother or sister comes to you. Would you agree? It's like, you might not like it, but it's like, I know what they're saying is right. You ever been there where somebody's rebuking you and it's like, ugh, oh, it's cutting you in two? But it's like, I can't question that, that brother, that sister is telling me exactly what I need to hear as if God was standing in front of me. Well, can I interpret what that is? That's love. That's love. Love tells you what you need to hear and the devil tells you what you want to hear. It's hard to kind of work out who's talking to you. Um, the devil will just pander to your flesh because your flesh just stinks. But anyway, let's move on. So I want to really look tonight at these seven churches. And I want to look at Jesus' medicine for all their problems. Okay? So Jesus had medicine for the problem. And by the way, he's got medicine for us. When you take a wrong turn. So as we work through this, I really want you to kind of consider... He is encouraging these churches that have messed up what he's actually telling them. Ron, would you read this tonight? And by the way, you'll see I've highlighted the word repent in there, not because it's the only thing that God's saying, but you'll notice that all three churches, you'll find the word repent in there. So that's the only reason I've highlighted it tonight. But it's only one of a number of things he's asking. The church in Sardis, Revelation 3, 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God Revelation 3.3 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou shalt not watch I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee okay so I have a couple of questions here tonight, and I need your help because th this is this is the best counsel, okay, that, that anybody can get. It's coming direct from Jesus, okay. For the record, would you agree? Revelation two and three are Jesus talking to the seven churches, okay. So, what does Jesus mean here to be watchful? In your opinion, what does it mean to be watchful? In practical terms, just in, in practical everyday terms, Jeannie and then Christy. Attention. Huh? Pay attention. Okay, pay attention. Kind of, yeah, keep your guard up. You're in a war. Mm -hmm. keep your Amen. So I'm, I'm going to look a little bit more at that in a few seconds. What about the second one? What does Jesus mean here to strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die? Okay, at this stage, before you answer, and don't all rush at one time. Um, okay. I want to say this because people misunderstand a lot of the counsel in Revelation 2 and 3. They don't realize that he's talking to a whole congregation. Okay? A lot of the time they just take it that he's talking to one individual. Okay? He's saying this church is about to die. By the way, you can be in a dead church. Amen? You can be alive in a dead church. Um, you can be dead in, in a living church. Does that make sense? You know, but both are, are I'm just telling you that, that he is talking to a church here and saying you're, the, this church is about to die. Okay, so what does he mean here? Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Get things, yeah, run. What is this thing it is? I'll be talking about recognizing what are the promises that he has for us and start turning to them and stop pulling off your feelings. Yes, that's another one. Anybody else, any thoughts? Because he's talking to this church. Things are about to die. Like, And he's saying here, strengthen them. 
Oh. Yep. I mean, that would be a big thing. Obviously, his truth. Within a congregation, his truth is extremely important. What about the next question? Because I'm, I'm going to try and address these here, just in a little bit more depth. What does Jesus mean here? To remember, therefore, how that thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Just the gospel message. Keep the gospel pure. The message of Christ. Amen. Anybody else? Any thoughts on that? I would say it's their when they first became born again. Mm -hmm. How they originally were. Remember that, mm -hmm. and I think that's what they're talking about when you're strengthened too. Strengthen that part. That it's about to die. So, yep. Yeah. I mean, th there is a large part of this. This actually, and you'll find it with the next church. He's basically getting them to look back the way, and he's actually he says, "Remember." What does it mean to remember? Ponder, consider, look back. Like, look back, think about what it used to be like. And that's why, you know, tonight this is a challenge for us because we can look back and, and ask the question, has something changed? Has something changed in our Christian walk? Have we lost something that we used to have? And that's the challenge of revival. It's pointless us talking about revival as some abstract thing out there if we are not involved in this conversation sense that this is talking about us. I'm, I'm not saying that this church is dead. I'm saying that the, we can all be apathetic and lose our cutting edge. So this is applicable to us as we uh, navigate through this subject of revival. Okay. What does Jesus mean here to repent? Christine. Turn from what you're putting your hope and trust in and turn back to him. Amen. Michael Bryan? Okay, okay. So, I just want to do a little bit, um, a, a little bit a dig deep. And first of all, this word watchful. We've quoted this passage many times where it says, be, uh, be sober, be vigilant, your devil as ro walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This is actually the same Greek word, or watch. And it Actually, let me tell you what the word means, because it means to keep awake, be vigilant, be watchful. And I'm telling you, if ever there's a day that we need to apply this to our heart, it's today. Would you agree that it's, it's a day where within the church there's a lot of compromise, in the professing church? Um, there's a lot of battles that are being fought today. Like, let me just use one example we've covered in Decatur, which is alcohol. Back when I was young, this wasn't even a battlefield in Christian circles. If you were a Christian, you just did not go for alcohol. It's just like, you know what? You're a Christian. You're a new creature. That's who you used to be. This is who you are now. Today, pastors have to fight this battle with pastors. And it's like, it's wearisome to talk to pastors and they're like, oh, well, I don't agree with you, brother. Or talk to elders and I don't agree with you, brother. I, 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 I have a few drinks and I don't see any problem in it. Okay, I'm just saying that we are living in a compromised day within the church, but we're living in a messed up day out there like never before. Like society is messed up. It really is. So for us to be vigilant, to be awake, to be watchful is like, hello. And I can tell you, if you're not, then you're going to get hit hard. <coughs> you think I'm being unfair there to say that? That if you're not vigilant, you're going to get hit. <coughs> so, <coughs> so this here tells me we need to keep our guard up. So when you see that to be watchful, I, I put it to you, be watchful. Keep your paws up, uh, be vigilant, and just be careful. What about the phrase, the things which remain? Do you know what that literally means? That which is left behind. Okay, so the church wants on fire, okay? So this church in Sardis was once on fire for God. Now they're about to die, okay? 66 years after the cross, 
They're about to die. So think about that. If you think about that, alive, on fire for God, seeing a move of God, then they're about to die. And it, it says this, to strengthen that which is left behind. What do you think that's talking about? Or is there, does that give any further insight into what we're looking at? The fire that you moved at in the beginning when you first got touched with the Holy Spirit and you're really on fire for the Lord and you're ready to go to battle at any second and then you just, and then now it's like, you know, you just lost that. It's just you you don't have that fire, you don't have that desire no longer to reach people how you used to. That's how I see it. Amen. Jesse. Um, by the way, the word, I overlooked the word strength in there. It means to turn resolutely in a certain direction. So, um, strengthen, turn resolutely, like Jesse talked about the farther, boldly, determinedly, like, okay, this is the way, this is where I used to be, here's where I am at the moment, and like, I'm, I'm determined to get back here. I'm determined to be on fire for God. I'm, de- I'm resolute. I'm fixed upon it. I'm going to get there. So when it says that which is left behind, it kind of, to me, it kind of, I think of a fire. We talked about this before where the flame's out, but the embers are still there. Okay. So it's not a blazing fire. Okay, over here, the church has got a blazing fire. Over here, it's just like the fire is about to go out. And I think we, we covered this a few weeks ago, something similar. So what do we need to do with the embers? Just the, the embers need, they need fanned, okay? The flames need. So I think that that's really what I'm trying to push at. But I'm going to get the help here of three commentators. Uh, Adam Clark, Albert Barnes, and Sam Storms. Just to see what they think of this. So, oh, oh, there they are. Okay, so Kyle, would you help me with these here? Adam Clark says, you lost ground by carelessness and inattention, awake and keep awake. Albert Barnes explains the phrase, strengthen the things which remain, are ready to die. It is to cultivate all the graces which do exist, to nourish all the love of truth which may linger in the church, and to confirm by warm exhortation and by a reference to the gracious promises of God's word the few who may be endeavoring to do their duty and who, amidst discouragements, are aiming to be faithful to the Savior. Sam Storm says, The exhortation to wake up suggests that a church can experience spiritual slumber, having fallen asleep and thus inattentive to what matters most. You're in a dream state, says Jesus. You're living in an unreal world created by your own false criteria of what is pleasing to God. Shake yourself awake and return to reality. Being asleep, the church is oblivious to its perilous condition, unaware of the threat it faces. This is no time to take a nap. Anybody, anything grab you there? Or can you identify or relate to any of that? I'm just saying, is there anything there that makes sense that describes where this church really was? Uh, What the answer is? Christine. It, well, what stands out is the false criteria mm-hmm. of what is pleasing to God. Yeah. Ooh, like you're deceiving yourself, mm-hmm. and you're getting all comfortable in that, and you think you're fine, mm-hmm. and then maybe people are watching that and, mo- and watching that modeled. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can anybody relate to that? I mean, th- there's times we kind of convince ourselves that this is what healthy Christian living is. And we kind of know in our own spirits that it's not. The, here's the hardest part, when others start to follow our example. And I'm telling you, here's where I see it, okay? We've all got influence, okay? I can see this individual has an influence of this group of people. I start to see them missing church. What happens then to those around them? What do you think happens? Honestly, it's like, it, or they start doing this thing, and then they start doing it. They start, and they start to talk like this person is like, whoa, whoa, this is like spreading. This is contagious. I'm telling you, all the ugly stuff is so contagious. 
you know, when we do a good thing, um, it'd be nice if when we'd done the good thing, it was just contagious. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like It's like sometimes when you're kids, you say, oh, why did they take all my bad habits? Why did they not take my good habits? Huh? You know, but there's something about us, like we want to, our flesh wants to justify what we're doing. And we're all guilty of it. To whatever degree, whatever season. You know, this may be the season that you're getting it. But you have to walk carefully. Let him who think he standeth take heed lest he fall. So there's no room for pride. You know, right, I've mastered it. I've got it. As soon that the moments that you get to that stage where you think you're better than the rest, you're ready for a fall. I'm telling you, God has got a way of taking you through a little journey, a little part of the journey, and guess what? You come out the other side going, <laughs> you're, you're glad to get through it, and you're glad to have a pulse, and you're glad to know that he still loves you. Can you relate to that? That you know, I'm just saying I've learned. Just be careful to write other people off. Be careful to think that you're get you've got it, you've arrived, and whatever. I'm telling you that even when we are on the highest of the highest mountain, we're still falling really short of our revelation and to do with even our character compared to Jesus. So here's here here's a nugget in the midst. When you're doing good, don't be discouraged. I mean, but if you feel like any type of pride or complacency, just like comfortableness coming in and you're looking down on all the ones down in the valley and going, oh, I'm glad I'm not like them or them. Okay, just compare yourself to Jesus. Look up. Look up and compare yourself to him and it'll keep you humble. So I'm saying that's revival because I do believe that you can be walking in revival and if we're in revival we will be a help to all those around us because like Kimberly tonight we've talked about we've talked about her because we love her and we care for her and we can't wait to see her back on the front line that's a heart toward someone that we deeply love so before we move on what does Jesus mean here to remember therefore how thou hast received Heard and hold fast. Les has mentioned some good stuff there. Anybody else got a thought before we? Yes, Christine. Um, well, when you were saying about the being watchful and keep awake, um, Jesus was telling that to the disciples when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. He's like to watch and mm -hmm. pray, mm -hmm. and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, like snoring and sleeping. And I didn't realize that's like the same thing. It and is. It's warning and like something like big's happening. You guys need to, you you need to watch. Be awake. Keep your eyes on me. Like it's okay to depend on me for strength right now. Um, because we don't, we don't, I don't think we always realize that we're in a battle and the enemy does want to take us out and God does want to use <coughs> us mm -hmm. too. So. Amen. It's, when they say, when it says remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast, it's always good to look back as believers. It, it, it always is to reflect. Reflect on what God has done. Okay? So, what about just for two two minutes? Like, when you look back, what are you glad for what he's done to you? Just shout it out. What has he done for you? What? Me out of the pit. Family. Roland? He's done everything. Amen? I, 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 I can't live. Amen? <laughs> Michael Bryan? Saved my life. He saved your life. Anybody else? When you remember, you look back, what stands out to you? Changed my desires. Changed your desires? Kept me from going to hell. Kept you from going to hell? Kept me from evil. Yeah. Everlasting love. By the way, we're obeying Jesus tonight. He says, remember. He says, look back, remember. Remember, listen, this is what he said to remember. Remember, therefore, what you've received, what you've heard, hold fast. What else? Brian, when you look back, when you remember, what stands out to you? I always say that, like, oh, you were really prideful. 
like in my speech and in my mind i wouldn't think i was mm -hmm. um but you look back and you're like yeah you were you but you were almost powerless to stop it it was just deeply ingrained into who you were and then you look you know then look forward and you're like i'm no longer that not to say i don't struggle with pride or whatever mm -hmm. but i'm no longer that man i used to be mm -hmm. and it's you you want to think that you can just take the shortcut in the wilderness mm -hmm. um you can just I'm going to be that person and I'm just going to decide today I'm going to be that man. But then you look back and you're like, if it wasn't for those setbacks and negative, seemingly negative moments in your walk with the Lord, you would not be the person that he's created you to be. Mm -hmm. And more so like your friend in, Ca in Canada about, you know, we all want to be on the mountaintop, mm -hmm. but it's the valley where things grow. Yeah. So that's good. Um, so it says what you've received. What have you received? What's the greatest thing you've received? With salvation, you've received forgiveness, a whole load of things. Peace, joy, a future, eternal life. Um, so he's, he's telling us to remember what we've received, remember what we've heard. And so I always think it's good to remember. And I think that's what he was pushing out of that church. And I'll say this, the reason why we're looking at this is because they were once on fire. They, they, they were literally, the pulse was ready to go out. And this is what he's saying. Here's the answer. Here's the answer to your problem here. This will bring you out of this state. Um, I wrote down here in the notes, if we are blessed with a good heritage, powerful talents, and there is powerful talents in this house tonight, material blessings, biblical knowledge, time, opportunities, etc., 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 it is expected that we use these well to glorify God and to benefit other people. Okay, so as we look at what he has given us, we've received. We've received a lot, and we've received a lot so that we can give a lot. Freely have received, freely give. We're living on it, honestly, and I'm telling you, we're living in a day where the gospel has been merchandised like never before. I'm telling you, it's most Christian counseling out there today, you're going to pay a lot of money to get Christian counseling today. People are making big bucks out of Christian counseling. You want to go to counseling, it, generally it's $120 an hour to $160 an hour, be $180 an hour Christian counseling today. People are making big bucks. And to me, there's something not right about that. And I'm telling you that the reason why they're making big bucks, and I've said this for years, I don't know whether any of you remember, if, if you want to have a job for life, young people, go into counseling today. Because everybody today needs a personal counselor. And I, I said this 10, 12 years ago. If, if you want a job for life, Go down that road. Because it's going to become the... It's going to... Just like somebody needs a gardener. You need a gardener. Everybody's going to have their personal counselor. And it shocks me today. Like, honestly. And by the way, I'm all for Christian counseling. Okay? So please don't think I'm beating on Christian counseling. Christian counseling is actually part... A healthy part of the Church of Jesus Christ. What I'm talking about is we're living in a day where, the, where this counseling has been merchandised. I have a difficulty with that. And simply because freely have received, freely give. And we have, we've received a lot. And how expensive was it? I mean, ultimately, how much did he charge you for salvation? How much did it cost you, really? It cost him everything, but for us, we, we just had to receive it. If you go back to the day that you were born again. So, I want, to, I want to finish this segment of what we're looking at with hopefully a quote from Sam Storms again. So listen to this, because this really grabbed me. Sam Storms said, there are three ways that all this here can be done. Number one, he says, remember. And he said, just as Jesus exhorted the Ephesians in 2.5, so also those in Sardis. Past history should challenge us to present endeavor, recall the blessings of divine grace, and be strengthened by the assurance 
that what God once did, he can certainly do it again. So that's the first thing, remember. The second thing that stood out to him is hold fast. And he put in brackets, keep it. Hold fast, keep it. Um, and this is what he said, you don't need anything new. Simply hold firmly to what you've already received. The terms used here, received and heard, probably refer to the, the Christian traditions which they received. Basically, the upbringing, the solid upbringing that they had here when the church was on fire, he's basically saying, hold on to these. Okay? Remember, hold on to these. And finally, he says, repent. And he, say, he, he says, stop sinning, start obeying. Isn't that good? Remember, hold fast or keep it. And number three, repent. And this, is, this was Jesus' medicine to get from here to here, back to where they were. And I, I think that it, it's important sometimes to remember, take yourself back to when you really were, it was just so, it was just a joy. To, it was just a, a joy to be a Christian, a pleasure to be in the house of God, an honor to get out there and tell others about Jesus. And if you're not there tonight, the good news is you can be back there tonight. It's not an A to Z. It's simply, well, here, here's Sam Storm's ABC. Remember, stand fast, hold fast, keep it. And thirdly, repent. Just t turn away from that, that, that ugly stuff, the sinful stuff, and obey the Lord. So let's move on to the Church of Ephesus here real quick. Ron, would you read this, please? This is the, the medicine again. The Church of Ephesus, Revelation 2.5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Okay, what's the candlestick in Revelation? What, what does it represent? It's his presence. Okay, so again, and I'm telling you that people's theology gets messed up because he's not talking about an individual here. He's talking about a group of people. He's actually saying, I'm going to take the presence out of this church unless they do what? Okay, so do you understand this? Some people will quote that as if it's talking to, like, I'm going to take it. I'm telling you this, he's saying to this church, if you don't waken up here, I'm out of here. I'm done with this. I'm not going to be involved in this sham. Um, and by the way, this church in Ephesus was known throughout um, the whole Middle East has been a church full of love. That's what they were known for, the love. The church of Ephesus in Scripture, um, theologians, if you read them, they all say Ephesus was a church known for its love. What was the problem here? They had lost their first love. So, I just want to look at this for just a, a moment, okay? Um, Vance Havner says this. He's a Baptist pastor. A revival is the church falling in love with Jesus Christ all over again. Okay? Let's think of marriage for a moment. Guys, marriage is hard work, okay? Would you all agree? It's like, it just doesn't happen. There's times you have to work hard at it um, because it's two human beings trying to be one. Okay? Men and women think differently. They, you go through seasons where you think differently now than maybe you did two years ago. And maybe in a couple more years' time, you're going to be thinking even different. So there's so many like challenges. Some people like the color blue. Some people like the color gray. Some people like red. Like Everybody's so different. But two people trying to be one is a challenge. Okay? So I'm just saying that to say this that we have to fall in love all over again. Sometimes in marriage, you have to just go out on a dinner date or something. You, maybe you haven't been on a dinner date because, you know what, you're married a few years and you just become complacent. You know, she loves me, he loves me, and, you know, and, and you just, you, the things you used to do back in the day, they just, you don't do it anymore. And before you know it, they, no, but the love's just not the same. 
There's just some that that, that that there's a flame there. There's a little little flame, but it's not like a big enormous flame. But sometimes a little dinner date can work wonders, or a bunch of flowers can work wonders. Huh? I'm okay. So I'm using that in regard to this. Okay. Sometimes we just have to fall in love with the Lord all over again. How do we do that practically? How do we fall in love with him all over again? Because something that happened here, they'd, they'd lost their first love. What do you think, Mr. Les? Oh, okay. Okay, put him in the naughty chair. You were talking about falling in love again. And I was... Okay. Oh, you were telling a little story to him and you were distracting him. <laughs> okay. So. Read your Bible. Start there. Start reading your Bible. Uh, Lisa? You have to ask for help. You have to ask him. Help me. Help me love you more. You know? Exactly. There's t times we can be determined and have the desire to want to love him more, but it's just not. It, we can't whip ourselves up. Ron? I just uh, witnessed a, what looked like a couple going on a date the other night. So impressive. She's sitting there in the chair across the table, just sitting there, and he's sitting across there punching buttons on his cell phone the whole time. No communication, nothing going on. There has to be a turning and saying, I want to communicate with you. I want to talk to you. I want to be in your presence and enjoy that presence. Exactly. Would you agree there's something lost there? And it's, oh, love you too. <coughs> love you too. <laughs> huh? No, but there, there's something that, okay, the fire has went out, okay? Well, it's the same here. That I agree with Vance Havner that we need to just fall in love with the Lord Jesus all over again. That's where it starts. It, it's all about Him. Um, most of you know that the Greek word for love in God is agape love. Amen? In fact, um, 1 John 4, 16 literally reads, God is agape love. That's who he is. Okay? So I want to just remind you, okay, because the big issue here with the church of Ephesus was love. There was a problem with their love life. So I want to just check, and we're going to check your love life now, okay? So we're going to do a QA and a we'll give out, everybody's, no, no, okay. So we're going to actually look at this agape love just to see how we, um, Kyle, read this here. Um, agape love is God's love. Okay, so we'll start with this here. Agape love is a love that consumes. It is the highest and purest form of love, one that surpasses all other types of affection. It is a selfless and sacrificial love. It is a love that is passionately committed to the well-being of others. It is a love that loves the unlovable. It is unconditional love. It is circumstance-free love. It's not a special love. Would you agree that that is the love that God has given to us? Okay. Would you agree that there's nothing greater than to be the recipient of it here? I mean, this is the peak of the mountain in life. For the God of the universe to actually bestow that on you, that's as high as it gets. If you've experienced that tonight, you have experienced true love. Now, I want to say to our young people tonight, one of the problems for young people is they're searching for true love. Perfect love. Would you agree? Oh, I want to meet Mr. Right. I want to meet Miss Right. Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you, I don't care how, how good Mr. Right looks, he's going to fall short. Uh-huh. I'm telling you, you'll be married, not six months, you'll be married like a month to him. And it's like, this isn't, he's just not a perfect as I thought he was, okay? And for you men, you can think that you've got Miss America. And it's like this, she is the best thing from sliced bread. You wouldn't believe it. But I'm telling you, you get married to her, you realize she's imperfect. Amen? I mean, okay. But I'm what I'm saying, we're looking for true love in the wrong place. True love can only be found in Jesus Christ. There's no human that of themselves 
can represent this perfectly. But I'm telling you, if you're looking for a partner, you're looking for these qualities anyway. Um, and if you if you meet a Christian that's on fire for the Lord, that should be in there somewhere. Would you agree, Mr. Brown? Shouldn't uh, it? I would say a, a gap in love is a love that you can feel, mm -hmm. actually feel, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. That's well, but, I mean, people, I mean, to be fair to natural love, people definitely feel that. Like, yeah. they're like, oh, I've got the butterflies, I can't sleep at night. Like, they, they feel something, but what you're saying is, to feel this, this is to feel true love. Yes, but the, you know, again, that's why it's a selfish and a sacrificial love because it's not about me. It's not about my desires. See, people get married today and it's all about, oh, well, pastor, I've got desires here. I, I, it's like, okay, this is not a gap I love. This is all about me. And you talk to people today, young people today, it's all about them. I want, I, you know, it's all about my desires, me, but to me, love is a response to another. Um, Aaron. And just to be clear, this isn't, I mean, you know, you talked about the context of a man and a woman and a woman and a man. Mm -hmm. it, this can be a Christian brother to a Christian brother, a Christian mm -hmm. woman to a Christian mm -hmm. woman. This transcends the, you know, the, obviously you should look for this in a partner mm -hmm. because you can only get this from God. Yeah. But this transcends just... A marital relation between one man and one woman. This can be it, the church among itself. Well, it goes even further. It goes. It's a love that we can have for the lost. So it's not a love that a man and a woman can experience in a marriage. Go ahead, Terry. Well, I just say, um, love and the feeling and all that stuff is is great. But to me, love is still an action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you got to look at what Christ and God did for us. That's right. That's how He demonstrated His love to us. Mm -hmm. It the feelings and all that stuff can get pretty dangerous. It's that action to me that demonstrates the true love. Absolutely. That I mean, that's a brilliant example of selfless and sacrificial love. wasn't just kept in the heart of Jesus. He actually put feet to that love, and um, for us. That's the love that we should have for the lost. Because yet, when we were yet sinners, he died for us. And we love him because he first loved us. And the Greek word there is agape love. So I'm telling you people out there, we, we don't just love the brethren. This should be the love that's manifested in this house. Okay, here's the $64 million question tonight. Is this the love that you have tonight? Is this the love that you have in your heart? Or do you have a superficial love? Do you have a religious love? What do you think the love of the Pharisees was like? Was this it? Was this the love the Pharisees had? Is this the love that the dead churches have out there? When a sinner comes into this church, do they experience this here? Or do they just come in and experience a religious gathering? And I'm telling you, one of the things that touched my heart on Sunday was this, that um, Hannah brought in a friend on Sunday and he encountered the love of God. He f encountered the love of God in the people of God because we're not robots here. And he said to me, I, he says, I work a lot of Sundays. He says, but when I'm off, I'm going to be back here. That's what he said to me. And I'm telling you that Church should be more than, hey, I love the worship in that church, or hey, I love the pastor, or I love the sermon. It should be more than that. It should be there's something in this church that I can't resist. And it's the love of God. Because ultimately, you know, Jesus was said, oh, you know, he was asked, of all these things, what's the greatest? You know, he could have mentioned anything. Love was at the top. Love for God, secondly, Love for each other. So I, I'm just telling you that this is what the church at Ephesus lost. And this is what he's urging them to get back to. 
He says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Repent and do the first works, because it says earlier, you've lost your first love. So he's basically, get back to the way you were. Kindle that there. So, um, Kyle, would you read this here? God's love is true. It is deep. It is perfect. It is unchanging. It is pure. It is unconditional. It is irresistible. It is faithful. It is sacrificial. It is everlasting. Amen. Jeannie King. Isn't that agape kind of love, though, only, only with because of the Holy Ghost within us? Exactly. So when you're talking about these, the church or the church of whatever, Ephesus or whatever it was, what happened to the Holy Ghost? Where did it go? Okay, so the Holy Ghost, thankfully the Holy Ghost didn't go anywhere. The Holy Ghost was still there. But you see, with all these churches, it was like the Holy Ghost had kind of nearly had one foot outside it, ready to go. He's saying, like, unless you change, I'm out of here. And I'm telling you, God can remove his presence from a church. I, I've been into churches, and honestly, it's like, you go into it, and it's like, wow, there's something going on here. There's, uh, you either feel um, like there's division in the church, or there's nothing will push the Holy Ghost out more than division. If I go into a church, I can feel division in that church. I'm telling you. Have you ever been into a family, a, a workplace, or played against a sports team, and they're divided against each other? And you can just feel it. How does that end up? Okay, Kyle, sorry. Um, he says he'll remove, remove the lampstand out of that church. Um, to me, the lampstand gives light. It gives direction. It gives vision. Um, you can't see. You don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't say that you're not unsaved, but you have no power. The uh -huh. Bible, Peter says, uh, when he's being persecuted, he says, and he gives the Holy Spirit to those whom is obedient. If you're not, if you're disobedient, you're uh -huh. not going to be re receiving the power of God uh -huh. to do things because you're just not doing His will. Uh -huh. So why would He give you the power to do something and it's not His will? Uh -huh. So you're just going to be powerless and blind without vision, without direction mm -hmm. in that church. Does that make sense, guys? Um, anybody question? Listen, we're, we're not going to get tonight to the church of Laodicea. Because honestly, in my notes, I would planned to get to the church of Laodicea, but we've got to these two churches that, would you agree, they were messed up? That There was a time when the flame was bright. Would you agree? I mean, just read the book of Ephesians. That's the same church. Okay. Read the book of Ephesians and see how they're a great church. 66 years after the cross, they're not a great church. They're, they've lost their love. And this is the big issue in that church. Remember with the church at Sardis? He said, repent. The church of Ephesus, he says, repent. Basically, turn around. You're going to have to change. And that's the message for us tonight. If you aren't, if you're not on your A game tonight, if your heart isn't burning with the Lord or the things of God, you need to repent. You need to act. And honestly, where the victory starts is where you basically bow the knee and say, guilty. Lord, forgive me. I, I'm wrong here. I, it's, not, it's not because of him. It's not because of her. It's not because of you. It's not even because of the devil. It's because me, I'm just being whatever. Do you understand? That's where the victory always starts, when you take ownership. When you know, and I know, when you're sitting in, listen, gossip, oh, you're not going to believe about this. But when somebody's doing that, guess what? They're backslidden. How do you know they're backslidden? You're saying the one talking or the one listening? Well, well both. Both, because the one listening is just as bad as the one talking. So they're both backslidden. And I'm telling you, Pastor Lee Shipp said this. Every time somebody starts that nonsense with him, he says, hold on, have you talked to them yet? And he says, 100% of the time, the gossipers, the answer is no. They haven't went to their brother. They haven't went to their sister to get it resolved because they don't want it resolved. And this is what he does. Hold on here. Doot, 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 doot. Hey, James, uh, Susie wants to talk to you here. That's what he does. And that's what he exhorts pastors to do. When you have two people that aren't talking to each other, 
Just get to talk. There's something wrong with their love life. See, they're not functioning this here. They're functioning in the flesh. And I'm telling you that because you and me know that he's not gossiping about us today. Would you agree? He's not going to the angels and saying, I can't believe Curtis did that. Huh? Or I can't believe Ron did that. Do you think he's going about the angels talking about you tonight? Do you know what he's probably doing? He's covering up you. Because I've been reading in Proverbs a lot. In fact, and this is something I want to tell you, what I'm do, actually doing, I normally just read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation. I've been doing that for years. But you know what I'm actually doing now? I, 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 I'm not, it's not that I'm going to stop doing it, but I'm actually just reading through the book of Proverbs, finish it, going back to the beginning, reading through the book of Proverbs, going back to the beginning. And I'm like, you know what? There's a lot of nuggets in this book of Proverbs. And I'm just going to keep reading it until I get it. Seriously, I'm like, I'm about to go through it for the third time. Like, so I'm not moving on from Proverbs until I get some of these things because there's deep nuggets, there's deep wisdom in here. I want to love God more, but the reason I mentioned that is this. It talks about a true brother, and it says he covers the sins of his brother. And Pastor McCollum used to say that. He says there's of you in here and he says you've messed up big time and he says there's very few people knowing here in fact i know you know and maybe nobody else knows but he says they will not be hearing from me because they'll never know because i'm covering over for you. and he didn't say that as if he was condoning sin because i'm t- but he blew sin from the pulpit but he wasn't going to gossip about them he wasn't going to throw them under the under the truck, or the whatever, what's the phrase? Bus. Under the bus. He wasn't going to throw them under the bus. Do you know why he wasn't going to throw them under the bus? Because he loved them. He loved them. And I'm telling you, that's where the rubber meets the road in simple things like this. Covering for your brother, not justifying his sin, but, you know, not being like, and I'm not saying there's times, and please hear me, there's times where people have to come to the pastor and say, I need help here. I need it could be counseling for marriage. It could be concern for a mother that's gone wayward, or some. I'm not. Ta- that's not gossip. What's the difference between coming out of concern to try and pray through and to, to reach that person and just talking for the sake of it? The the motive is love. When when you're concerned, when you, when you're bringing up your mum, and you, you, there's a heart of love there. But if we were just going about, you're not going to believe what happened last week. Just gossip. That's just yuck. Ron, did you thought? Just going to say gossip is a stepping stone. Yes. And it, it uh, gossip just starts kind of small, and before you know it, it's like, really? Really? And it, it, you, before you know it, you get drawn into it. It's like, really? Are you serious? But you like to knock the other person down because that makes you feel better. Exactly. But I'm just, I'm saying this, guys, to say this. Nothing will quench the spirit more than division gossip, all that stuff. But there's nothing that will attract the presence of God more than that gracious, merciful, loving, long-suffering heart, because that's the heart of Christ. I'm telling you, revival will happen when we're just wide open. We're loving on Him, and we're loving on each other. And by the way, we're loving on the lost. Agape love goes further than the four walls, because we start to feel a heart for the guy that we're working with. So, hey, I'm going to finish there tonight. But next week, I want to go on to the Church of Laodicea. And then I want to try and get through the personal revival, collective revival, national revival. And then I also want to get to the subject of um, how revival is a sovereign move of God. And I've got loads of brilliant quotes, guys. I I have quotes from all the top revivalists, their account of what revival really looks like. Let's pray.